we're going to pivot a little bit from talking not about doing business in France, um, but about um, the relationship between, in a lot of ways, um, Rhode Island and Israel. And we're going to talk about it with our good friends at the Rhode Island Israel Collaborative, who have brought this next session to us, The Unstoppable Startup, Mastering Israel's Secret Rules of Chutzpah. Um, and I'd love to introduce first Avi Neville. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you. Uh... District Hall, Providence, Tuni, Amy, the whole team uh, for collaborating with us. Also want to uh, thank the Israeli consulate uh, in Boston. And basically we're going to have a very, very interesting uh, discussion today. A little bit about the Rhode Island Israel Collaborative. Uh, we are a non-for-profit uh, chamber of commerce to collaborate between Rhode Island, Israel, uh, in academia, research and business. Uh, we all volunteer. Um, so if you want to be helping and volunteering to build those relations, contact us. Uh, also, I'm happy to announce that today really is, this is the first uh, of new series. Uh, it's a monthly series with leading Israeli entrepreneurs and, innovator, and innovators who are changing the world. The next one will be on um, December 9 with Udi Mukadi uh, from CyberArk. Uh, and we'll have Jim Ludis from... Uh, uh, from um, Salve Regina University, we'll interview him. I think it will be uh, extremely interesting. And thank you uh, to, again, District Hall. We're partnering with you guys and uh, there will be other partners along the way. So very intriguing. Um, another comment, uh, next week, uh, we have a continuation of our series, The Little uh, State, Big Innovation, Rhode Island and Israel. We have Terrific three companies that this time the focus on uh, healthcare and um, education, two timely topics. And we'll have a guest speaker, Roman Simantov. Uh, he's the CTO of IBM Alpha Zone Israel and the resident CTO of the Rhode Island I RI Hub. So next week, a uh, very uh, successful program. We had two before, and I highly recommend for you to uh, join us. Uh, Another comment about uh, development relation, uh, Bird Foundation, they have grants for Israel and Rhode Island in the US and Rhode Island uh, in energy. So if someone interested, please contact us. And I'm really pleased to uh, introduce our um, uh, interviewer today, uh, Dr. Kathy Gordon. She's a board member and founder of the Rhode Island Israel Collaborative. Um, she's uh, the chief business officer of MetroBio she was Brown University Venture Officers Managing Director, uh, the same at Harvard University. Uh, Katie had a PhD in molecular biology. Uh, a very, very, very knowledgeable person. And I'm honored that Katie agreed uh, to um, participate today and be the interviewer. And last but not least, I want to thank our speaker, Uria Doni. Uh, took, um, an amazing connection through, uh, again, Udi Mukadi in that case. And then we are very excited to have you. And um, it just, uh, I'll give it to you, Katie. And that's the information about us. So thank you again, everybody, and enjoy the program. Hi, folks. Can everyone hear me? So it's really my pleasure to be um, introducing and then moderating a discussion with Uriah Doni who um, has a lot of experience um, both in the corporate, uh, corporate world and also in venture capital in Israel, and has recently written this great and very interesting book. Um, if you can see, I'm holding it up, The Unstoppable Startup. And it's got a lot of uh, really very um, exciting and interesting ideas on how Israeli entrepreneurs um, distinguish themselves in the world of startups by using um, not only just chutzpah, but unique brands of chutzpah. In any event, Yuri um, now is um, recently left um, many years as a venture capitalist at Jerusalem Venture Partners, and now is working with um, real estate startups and trying to enhance um, ecosystems really around the world, as he was telling me yesterday and has also joined a new group in Israel. And uh, Uri, are you on? Because I could hand it over to you to yeah. give yourself you um, a more thorough introduction and then 
Uh, I have a few questions um, to start the discussion, which hopefully will have a lot of examples because that's really, I think, what adds color to this. Miguel, I'm going to try to get a better lighting, but I'll hand it over to you now. Thanks. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, and it's a, it's a real pleasure to be to be here today. Um, so, Kate, as Katie said, uh, my background is mainly venture capital. Uh, I've been 13 years a partner at uh, Jerusalem Venture Partners. It's a $1.4 billion fund with a total exit of about $20 billion. Um, Multi-stage fund, so we did all the way from seed stage, A, B rounds, and late stage. IPOs in NASDAQ, M&As, and many companies that never made it as well. Uh, and uh, and so, in a way, the book I've written was kind of uh, uh, sharing some of the insights, uh, my insights, but mainly other entrepreneurs' insights uh, of how to create a successful startup. Uh, one of the interesting data points is that 70, 75% of startups actually don't make it. Uh, and so, if I could make a uh, modest contribution to decrease this number and increase the number of startups that actually succeed, that would be uh, my little contribution to the uh, entrepreneurial world. Uh, so that's me and happy to be here. Thanks so much. And I guess we'll have a chat back and forth and then encourage folks to um, send in your questions through chat and um, then we'll get to the audience uh, questions. So. I would be in, really interested if you could get into some depth on what you characterize as the six rules of chutzpah and then specifically examples of your experiences with um, folks and entrepreneurs in particular who have these traits and where it worked and where it didn't work. Sure. Uh, so first, for those of you who are not familiar with the word, chutzpah is a uh is a kind of Hebrew, Yiddish guess, uh, word that uh, means uh, audacity, go-to, being bold. It has a positive side and a negative side. The negative side is being uh, arrogant or rude. Uh, so naturally, I'm not talking about this part of chutzpah, but the positive side is, is very powerful, and I'll expand that in a minute. Um, one of the reasons that this came up, uh, and eventually I decided to write the book, was that uh, we had plenty of delegations, hundreds of delegations every year from literally all over the world coming to understand how come the Israeli ecosystem is so successful. It is the number two uh, ecosystem in the world after the Silicon Valley. And we have the most, uh, the highest uh, startups per capita in the world, high, highest venture capital per capita in the world, number three NASDAQ after US and China. And there's a lot of people, you know, asking what's the secret sauce. So I'm not sure that uh, I know what the secret sauce is, but I, you know, after interviewing quite a lot of people and traveling and there are other ecosystems around the world, uh, I thought that the, the differentiation edge is actually in the culture and within the culture is this thing called chutzpah that we have uh, w within our culture. Uh, and so I've tried to kind of uh, structure it in, in a way that, uh, um, people can actually understand what it is through examples, as we're at many examples of startups, and I'll, I'll expand in a minute. And, uh, and the idea is to have this kind of rules implement into your business. And by the way, it's not, it's true to any business, I guess, not just startup, uh, technological startup companies. Um, and, um, and the idea is that chutzpah actually can be taught. Uh, so in a way, unlike charisma, that you're either born with it or not, uh, I believe that this virtue of chutzpah can be taught and people can adopt it uh, if, they, if they find it relevant for them. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll give a, a couple yeah. of examples just to uh, uh, give an idea what I'm talking about. So in a way, the first rules of chutzpah is probably uh, the most important one uh, is uh, one should have the chutzpah to challenge the reality and the status quo. So it's it's mainly a mindset that uh, uh, you you have to adopt in a way uh, in, in the way you look at the world, uh, uh, so to speak. So uh, some people look at the world and say, okay, this is how things work, and they just accept it. And uh, entrepreneurs usually should 
look at it differently. This is how the world works, but I can actually improve it. I can make it better. I can answer the need in a, in a much better uh, way. Um, an example for that uh, could be a, a company uh, called Waze, if you're familiar with that. It's a navigation application. Uh, and the idea came, uh, Uri Levine is a great uh, entrepreneur, and uh, his idea was that it doesn't make sense that all the GPS that tells you where to go, it doesn't tell you where the traffic jams are. So you actually tells you the route, but doesn't tell you the best route uh, in terms of timing. And uh, he came with this concept and he said, you know, I think that people should share this information of how fast they drive, etc. And then you'll have this data that nobody has about the traffic situation in real time. Um, a lot of people, and, and, he, and, and he said, you know, re the reality is, I don't know. I only know in the, tra the traffic jam when I'm in it. And that doesn't make sis sense. This is the reality. And he said, again, I, I would like to challenge that through a, a solution that I think would work. Uh, he had a lot of um, uh, rejections, so to speak. People tell him it wouldn't work. There's too many GPSs in the world. Google Maps is there. Can you really beat Google, etc.? But he believed in it, and uh, he eventually prevailed. And uh, Google bought them for over a billion dollars after a few years because they actually came up with this concept and technology that enabled to improve the navigation uh, experience uh, uh, much better than it was before. So. He, he, for that matter, he didn't accept the fact that uh, that was the reality. He, he had the, the gut, so to speak, or the chutzpah to, to challenge that. Um, uh, you know, Avi mentioned Udi Mukadi, and uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's an amazing guy and a, and a great entrepreneur. He built an amazing company. And um, what he did in, in CyberArk, in a way, uh, was the whole concept. It was a, a, a whole concept. Uh, uh, or he built a new category, which is kind of the second rule of chutzpah that you should try to build a business that can dominate a, a, a market category. So it can be two ways. Either you, you go into a category that it's fresh and new and there's not too many comp competitors uh, and that you can actually try to dominate it, or you can invent a category and by inventing it, uh, you can actually dominate it. And one of the things that CyberArk did after a few pivots and, and, and a few uh, uh, changes they've done in the way, they discovered that the privilege act access within the organization is something that hasn't been properly uh, um, solved because most of the cyber securities were defending attackers from the outside. And CyberArk came and said, you know, the enemy can be from the inside and it can be an employee or it can be an, an outsider that penetrates an insider's computer, and then it's an insider attack. And uh, and and you know the stars came, you know, were 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 right in time because Snowden also there was a whole Snowden uh, um, uh, event at the time. It it really proved that you know a, a relatively um, young guy who just joined a, 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 an organization could, had the access to all this information. So that was a really good proof of concept why you need like privileged access. And, you know, CyberArk, you know, they IPO back in 2014, a very successful IPO in NASDAQ, uh, 1.4 billion and grew from there. Uh, again, they, they kind of uh, took this chutzpah and said, okay, we're going to dominate this category, even though there's much larger companies, they, they prevailed and they did it. Um, so there's, again, there's six rules like this. I, I, I'm not sure we have the time to go through all of them, but the idea is that, uh, that an entrepreneur, and by the way, I think that any entrepreneur around the world has this chutzpah thing within them. Uh, maybe they don't call it this way, but, um, but when you want to challenge, whether it's Uber that challenged the whole, you know, transportation, uh, uh, area, uh, you know, market, uh, whether it's Airbnb who challenged the whole hospitality uh, or, or Twitter that came up with a completely new concept that nobody had before and they dominated the market. So I guess it's, it's true to any entrepreneur. Uh, in Israel, we have this, so to speak, framing or cultural explanation behind it that uh, enables us maybe to uh, do it in a more natural way, so to speak. What do you mean um, that the culture enables... Uh, this to be exhibited more naturally. Would you elaborate on that a bit? So chutzpah, sure. Chutzpah is part of the Israeli um, culture, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. 
I, I'll give you a, a simple, a, we don't have a word for understatement in Hebrew. There's no such a thing. And because we don't, <laughs> we just don't have that. We don't know how to under, <laughs> understate, we don't have understatement. We're very bold, we're very go-to, we're very direct. And, uh, and again, sometimes it's on the negative side of chutzpah. But it's something that we kind of grow up with uh, as part of our culture. Um, mm -hmm. I would also say that it's not just an Israeli thing. It may be even a Jewish thing. Uh, because if I look, you know, hundreds of years back, uh, the Jewish education system at the time, where people were sitting in what they called cheder, it's like a, a room with, where they studied the Torah and the Bible, the whole idea there was that the students will challenge their rabbi and previous explanations of the, of the Bible, and, and they would challenge their explanation and come up with a new explanation. So it's kind of, in a way, rooted within the culture that you don't accept things as they are. You actually challenge them, and you try to come up with your own solution or explanation or, or, or any of that. So again, I think it's, in a way, we kind of grow up with it as Israelis. Um, but as said earlier, I think that this mindset that once you get, once you adopt this mindset, you, you, it can be adopted anywhere in the world by any entrepreneur or, or businessman or woman. That was my next question, but you know, in other countries that aren't quite so oriented around the bold startup and accepting out of the box ideas, do you think there's different kinds of flavors or adaptations? that would be needed? Yeah, I, I think that um, you, you, in a way, other cultures or other entrepreneurs in other cultures need to step outside their comfort zone in a way, because they're, they're, in many cases, they, are, they used to be on the safe side. Um, you know, in, in Europe or in even Southeast Asia, there's a lot of places where you just, you know, you have to follow the rules and, and that's it. Um, and, uh, and by the way, another rule that I mentioned is you can bend the rule sometimes. That's also part of, <laughs> of having some chutzpah. And so I think that um, you need to come out of your comfort zone of the, whatever you're used to uh, in terms of, okay, this is how things have been working from, for, I don't know, centuries and why change it or why challenge it? It's been working, that's fine. Uh, and, but I think once you do that, uh, you actually find it very... Uh, very productive. Uh, there's a great example. We, ha we hired a, a, a US uh, uh, CEO at the time for one of our portfolio companies. And uh, we had this, an Israeli operation and a US operation. And uh, after like two weeks, uh, he called me and said, listen, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm good for this role. And I, you know, I said, why, John, what happened? And he said, you know, when I talk to my US employees and tell them what to do, they just go and do it. And when I talk to the Israeli employees, they start arguing with me and challenging me and said, we can do it this way, why this way and start. And he was very confused in a way by that. And I told him, you know, I understand what you're saying, but give it, give it a chance. Let them talk, let them be creative. Some of the best ideas will come from, you know, the salesperson or the engineer or the product or the marketing. You should let them, let, let, hear them, let them speak. And he actually adopted that. And after like a couple of months, he said, you know, I love it. They keep challenging me and I'm, you know, I have this really good interaction with them. Uh, and this comes up much, much better ideas that I would have thought of because they're in the market, they feel the customers, etc. So in a way, once he changed his mindset from a manager perspective and said, you know what, I would, I would, I, I don't want this uh, uh, hierarchy that I said something that everybody needs to follow, but rather let the discussion, the creative discussion happen. Naturally, once a decision is made, everybody should follow that, but let a creative discussion uh, be uh, before this de uh, decision, be because in, in many cases, these decisions are, are better after this uh, creative and open uh, and very direct discussion that, uh, that the management enables uh, to have in the company. So you're really talking about rules for the entrepreneur and rules for the company and, you know, an environment more than a specific set of guidelines for starting up a startup successfully. But, you know, again, going into other cultures, how would you, um, how would you lay a foundation or how would you sort of 
teach, you know, let's go to an extreme you know, an oriental culture like you're mentioning and say, you know, here's a blueprint. How would you, how would you um, uh, suggest getting folks to maybe give it a try in a circumstance? And do you have examples? Um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I had the chance to, um, um, to give some talks at the time in Europe and uh, in Germany in one of the incidents. And, and one of the things I've discovered is that there are some very, very bright people there, uh, but they're very afraid uh, of failure uh, to a degree that the culture around them, uh, if you fail with your company, you're like doomed for life. It's, and, uh, and this is very basic because then you don't, you don't take the risk. So they go to work for SAP or Siemens, but because they're so intimidated by failure. And the way I think, uh, and, and this is poor, important because again, failure is part of this business of venture capital or, or creating a startup. I think that uh, if you change the mindset and say, okay, failure is an event, it's not a person. It's not that you as uh, an individual are, uh, are a failure, you're not. You have, fa the, the, the business have failed because of all sorts of reasons, the competition, the funding, the whatever, the technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that the way the, the surrounding treats you, again, is very important. So in a way, it's not just about, uh, it's just about the startup itself. You need to kind of educate the whole uh, ecosystem to treat it in the, right, in the right manner so people wouldn't be intimidated to take risks. And all the good companies, all the successful companies are, are based in a, in a risk, you know, you nobody knew that they would succeed before they succeeded. And there's many companies we never heard of because they never succeeded. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but there's always a risk element to it. So I think it's a cultural thing uh, uh, as part of the society of the community that should also kind of uh, encourage and support entrepreneurs rather than you know, telling, okay, you failed, you're doomed. Uh, by the way, there's an interesting statistics that show that the second timers so people who failed in their first startup, their chances of succeeding in the second startups is five times more because they've learned, you know, they have more experience now. So in a way, uh, your second time entrepreneurs, their chances of, of success is, is much higher than the first time. That's very interesting. I can attest to having made like a ton of mistakes in my first company. Not that they were all, but you know, you go back and you say, I'd never do that, I'd never do that. So in a way, you're also saying, you know, some of this shift has to do with VCs. Like, you know, you're speaking on both sides of this whole thing, you know, and in your experience on the VC side, you know, um, I'm expecting that you would be rewarding entrepreneurs for thinking out of the box and creatively, but, you know, um, a lot of the uh, culture that would reward people for trying things, even if they fail, that's also in Silicon Valley as well, but in Israel, that's another kind of avenue to changing uh, cultural perceptions and maybe getting a better crop of startups. So how would you go about it from that perspective, looking at, you know, ex-US and ex-Israel sort of around the world, Europe and elsewhere? Yeah, so I, I think from the VC perspective, um, you know, the big exits come from, again, from the the big bets that you've done. If you go on the safe side and uh, you just do kind of a uh, evolutionary company, yeah, you you may get two x, three x in a good case, and, and that's not it's not interesting enough. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to do a revolutionary company rather than an evolution, and uh, and when you do a revolution, you need to have some kind of hypothesis, uh, i.e., the the entrepreneur or the founders of the company, uh, saying you know where the world is going. Um, uh, and again, it, it addresses another rules of chutzpah that I, that I have that you should foresee the future. And you should say, okay, this is where the world is going. And I'm betting that the, in two years or three years, the world will need that. Um, there's a, a good example of a company that we invested at the time, just when the cloud, uh, cloud computing started, called Navajo. And uh, they had this uh, technology, they, they had this hypothesis and said, you know, companies, uh, organizations would, would have to put their data on the cloud. Uh, but nobody thought that because it wasn't safe. 
So they, mm. they came up with a solution to encrypt the data back and forth from the cloud. And they were one of the first ones uh, to do it because they said that would be a real need that people will, uh, the organization will need. And, and they got it right. And Salesforce, Salesforce bought them after, I think, a couple of years from inception. But again, they kind of took a chance, had this hypothesis and succeed. Sometimes you have an hypothesis and the world is going to a, di a different direction, which is again, part of the business. But I think that from a VC perspective, uh, I would say that any company, almost any company that we invest in, uh, has the have the potential to become some kind of a category leader. They don't always uh, 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 become uh, such a category leader, but they have the, the initial potential. So I think that in many cases, uh, as the venture capital, you want to drive the company. You want to t to tell them, you know, take the risk, go further, have a big vision. Uh, rather than you know to to take uh, very safe steps and and then even if you succeed it, it's not that much of a success but and and the chances is that it wouldn't be a very interesting company so I guess the VCs definitely have a a role in kind of pushing the startups and the entrepreneurs a little bit out maybe of their comfort zone uh, when that is needed. So from the VC side. Can you spot um, the ideal creative entrepreneurs when they walk in the door? Like, you know, in the first 15 seconds, you know who they are or do you have to listen to their pitch? Um, I guess neither, <laughs> so, or both. Uh, I think that what we look at when, when, you, when we look at an entrepreneur, we like to look at an entrepreneur uh, it's not just the Excel sheets and the, you know, the go market, go to market strategy and these things. There are a lot of uh, kind of um, other elements that are important. Uh, one of the main thing would be their passion, for example. Uh, you want genuine passion. Uh, and it's, it's very hard to fake passion. You're either passionate about what you do or you don't. And the passion is not about the money. It's not about the exit. It's about this need or passion to change the category, to change the world or, or do something that nobody did before. And you just feel this energy and you want these entrepreneurs to have this passion uh, when they come and, and when they build the company, this passion, it's just, it's contagious. So you, when, it, when it's there, you, you know, it's there. It's like, I don't know, American Idol, you see somebody who say he's talented, you don't know why, but you feel it. So uh, I guess it's a similar thing with entrepreneurs. Uh, the other thing you look for is uh, obviously, you know, some kind of experience, some uh, 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 high knowledge of the business that they're in, the market that they're in, the comp competition, etc. cetera. Uh, but you all, always, you also want them to be very focused in what they're doing. So you don't want them to come and say, okay, we have this technology, but we're not really sure what to do with that. They should come and say, okay, this is what we've built. This is what we're after. This is why we think that it's an interesting space. This is how we go into the market. This is how, this is the budget. This is the operation. So they got to be really focused. Uh, so in a way, with one with a big vision, with with a very clear operational uh, plan. The other thing that I tend to look at uh, is whether whether they have a high sense of urgency. Um, some some entrepreneurs feel that all right, we have the time. It'll take us another six months, another year no worries, we have the capital, et cetera. And that's not the right attitude. You need to run fast and then accelerate because somebody's chasing you. Even if you're not aware of them, there is somebody around the world building a similar thing and wants to get to the market. And you need to have a very high sense of urgency. And again, it's something that it, you don't see it in Excel sheets. You just feel uh, within the entrepreneur. So that's another thing. And maybe the last thing to uh, to mention is the dynamic between the team itself. Uh, most cases, you have teams of two or three people that are coming and pitching, and you know you have these very dominant CEOs who, who just shush everybody up and said, oh, uh, you know, ask question. They're taking the lead, and they're not letting their CTO or their other uh, member talk. And you don't want that. You want a good chemistry between the team and you want chemistry between yourself and the team because you're going to sit on this board for a few years and it's a, it's a kind of a small marriage. So, uh, and it, there's a lot of ups and downs. It's a, it's a real roller coaster, a startup. So you want to make sure that you have a team that you really have fun with, you have a good chemistry with, that they are good listeners, that they not only listening to people, but they can also listen well to the market because the market is usually 
the smartest uh, uh, that tells you where to go. Uh, so you have, I guess, all these kind of different things that you look at. So it's not the 15 seconds. It's not, uh, I wish, but I, you know, I don't have this crystal ball of, 16, of 15 seconds, but it's not also you know, only Excel sheets and financial elements and uh, you know, market uh, analysis. It's, uh, it's a lot of intuition and kind of uh, feeling your EQ as much as your IQ, I guess. But you could probably tell pretty close to off the bat if the personality of the presenter um, is somebody who's going to be having those values that you're talking about in your book, the different ways of looking at chutzpah, you could probably rule them out in 15 seconds. Maybe you won't give them all your money in 15 seconds, but you can really rule out somebody who, you know, is sort of overly um, cautious or, you know. Um, sure. I, I can give you a funny example. In the board meeting that we had, or the, you know, the meeting room, the corridor leading to the meeting room, uh, it's like an L shape. So you, we couldn't see the corridor. Uh, and there was this one CEO and it was an investment committee. So it was really a, after many meetings and due diligence. And it was kind of the, the meeting that they, we will decide whether they will um, get the investment or not. And all we could hear is, is the steps of the CEO. We couldn't see them. We could, and just for, and he was like slapping in a way. I would say it was just it didn't sound like somebody who's charging into a meeting room to get the deal. And in a way, before we even heard a word or saw the first slide, we already had this perception of somebody who's not hungry enough and not, you know, determined enough to to get the deal. And actually, it, it in a way we didn't make the investment eventually, not just because. The, and, and by the way, he didn't have any physical uh, disability or anything like that. Uh, so it was kind of strange how we all looked at each other and said, oh, this is, you want more energy. You want this, you know, you want this chutzpah, you want this determination, you want this bold approach when you come into a, 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 an investment committee. So, so what were uh, they like, walking around in circles or <laughs> just shuffling <laughs> yeah. back and forth or what? <laughs> no, we just, just heard them coming to the meet in the corridor. So. That was it. Shoulder slumped, yeah. Yeah. Metaphorically. Um, well, I guess if anybody else in the audience wants to join in with specific questions, this would be a great time. And I, I don't think I'm supposed to be leading this part. One of the one of the organizers. Yeah. But... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi, um, hi Amy. Uh, yes. Uh, Yuri and Katie, thank you very much for joining us. This has been fantastic. And I have so I have so many questions. Um, but for those of you who are in the audience, if you want to unmute yourself and ask too, um, I think we're a, a good sized group to do that. But I want to kick off with my first question. Um, Yuri, can you talk a little bit about kind of the gender balance of um, entrepreneurship in Israel and how I I am um, I've done a lot of research on early childhood education, and one of the things that I've looked at is the Israeli system, um, which allows, for those of you who don't know, um, for early childhood education starting at the age of three, um, and um, you know, allowing for more maternal employment. Um, but I would imagine it also impacts maternal entrepreneurship, um, which also gives you kind of a different way of looking at things. Uh, sorry for making that an essay of a question. So my question is, <laughs> what does the gender balance of um, entrepreneurship look like in Israel? Is, the, is it relatively split or how is it um, kind of structured? Good question. Yeah, so, so uh, I would say, unfortunately, it's not split enough. Uh, there are quite a lot of uh, women entrepreneurs, but uh, not as much as we would like to see. Uh, there are women uh, investors in VCs, but again, uh, there's still a majority of uh, males, so I think there's more diversity needed. Uh, having said that, I think that uh, the way we look, at, at least w the way we look at women entrepreneurs, we don't discriminate or we, we just look at the business, we look at the entrepreneurs, we look at the same thing, so there's no any discrimination, whether they are uh, uh, women or not. Uh, by the way, from a different angle of diversity, uh, there is uh, uh, there's a rather big uh, Arab community in Israel, 
uh, and I'm on the board of a, of a venture capital that invests in Arab entrepreneurs called Taqueen. Uh, and so because actually there, there was a, a, a lack of investment. So we created this fund that really supports Arab entrepreneurs in order to make them part of this uh, uh, VC uh, community of Israel. Um, so I, I would say that there is not enough diversity, but uh, there is all sorts of um, programs, uh, also from the government side, that supports uh, whether it's uh, Arab entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, uh, ultra-Orthodox entrepreneurs, by the way. So in a way, the government also gives them all sorts of incentives and support in order to uh, uh, join this, uh, this community. So I would say it's growing, it's on the right track, but I, I, I don't think we're there yet. Excellent. And then Gerald had a question that's kind of related about that kind of diversity is, um, he said, high energy is often code word for young person. How do investors feel about high energy, high experienced and innovative people over 65? So thinking about the older entrepreneurs. Um, I, I, I have to disagree. I think that when you have energy, you have energy. Uh, if you, you know, you, you can be a an old person that his age is uh, 22, and you can be a young person that his age is uh, 30, uh, 65. I think that the energy really comes from, from this passion. I think that the passion behind what you're doing, this is what kind of the, the core of this energy. And whatever you're, if you're enthusiastic about something, you, you, you will have this energy because you will, you will want to make it happen. You would want to, you know, make this idea or this company uh, become a reality. And, uh, and this energy, I think it's, it's ageless. So uh, I would say that, uh, by the way, most of entrepreneurs uh, in Israel are not in their 20s, are actually are in between 30 and 50. These are, this is the majority of the entrepreneurs. So it's not the first thing they do after, after they, uh, they finish the army in Israel. So uh, um, I think that if you're aware of that, and sometimes you do need to be aware of that, okay, am I high, now high energy or not? You know, like the sports players before a game, yeah, you can, you can get some energy uh, uh, inside you, so to speak, before the pitch. But uh, I, I don't think it's an age thing. I think it's a, it's a passion thing. Excellent. Wait, I, I have a question. Um, Rhode Island is developing its entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem and it's growing and it's, it's really nice and there is a potential here. One of the things that uh, is lacking here is VC money. Uh, what is the Israeli government and what would you suggest to our governor office here, commerce department, the, uh, the ecosystem, how to bring more VC money uh, because the talent is here, uh, the will is here, the energy definitely is here, uh, but that is a, a big problem, a lack of VC money. Um, so actually the, the VC industry in Israel was created back uh, in 1993 by a government program called Yozma. Uh, the idea at the time was that if you bring $12 million, the government will give you another eight uh, to complete a $20 million fund. And they've created 10 funds like that. By the way, JVP, the, the, the fund I was part of, uh, was one of them. And, um, and that actually boosted the whole VC industry in Israel. There's a, a lot of these v VCs are still active. Um, so in a way, one of, the, um, one of the ways to do it is to kind of tell potential investors or, or potential uh, 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 fund managers to incentivize them by, by some kind of a, a match, uh, a match making a thing. Um, there are other ways, which is, you know, incentivized through tax uh, incentive, through, you know, tax holidays, things like that. But this usually works better for corporates rather than VCs. Um, so I would say that uh, this is one thing. The other thing is that you don't necessarily need to have all the capital in, Ro you know, in Rhode Island, you need to attract capital to Rhode Island. So the VC can be in New York or in Boston and even in the Valley, but you want them to have a look at your ecosystem and actually inject capital to your ecosystem and to the startups. 
and again, you can do that by by uh, all sorts of means. And, and you mentioned government, so I'm addressing that. There's a there's a um, a program in Israel called uh, the incubator model, uh, which is uh, it's a license that is giving to uh, 20 incubators around the country. And the idea idea behind it is that when you invest in a company as an incubator, uh, it's usually for seed stage companies. Um, the government gives $500,000 to the company and you as an investor, you need to put only $100,000 on top of that. So it's a the, the, the majority of the risk is actually on the government. Uh, it's a very friendly uh, loan because it's a risk-free. If the company don't make, it doesn't make it, so they don't have to, to pay it back. If they do make it, they pay it back like 3% from the future revenue, something very, very uh, friendly. And so in that matter, the, the investors get some kind of a leverage from the government. Uh, and in that, in, in that way, you can actually get more equity for your money because the government don't they don't take uh equity for this uh incentive that they give so these incubators for example if they put a hundred thousand on top of the five hundred thousand and this should last for whatever 12 18 months um they get equity they can get 20 25 30 percent of the company for a hundred thousand dollars but in a valuation of two three million so in a way it's an, an attractive deal for investors so there's all sorts of ways to attract money. I would say that that probably the way to look at it is uh, twofold. One, how to attract VCs to open their offices in, in, in Rhode Island. And the other one is how to attract VC money into companies that are based in Rhode Island, and uh, which may come from other, other locations, but it will be some kind of a magnet for, for venture capital. That's interesting. Thank you. I, I never heard of programs similar to that, but um, it's definitely something that's been top of mind for most of us here in Rhode Island who work in this ecosystem. Um, we do have a question from Fred Rain about the Israeli tech ecosystem and how it compares to the Boston tech system, to ecosystem or Silicon Valley. Um, could you just kind of elaborate a little bit on maybe relative growth and size and um, yeah, so I think in, I, I think in terms of numbers, um, uh, again, it's 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 growing, and uh, it's in the I think last year it was over, I think it's around twelve billion dollars invested. So it's large numbers that are invested. Uh, I think, but the the main difference I would say between the these two ecosystems is the physical location, in the way that. Um, Israel is, a, is such a small country that it's, it's not an interesting market for a startup. So any startup from inception uh, actually needs to think of how it globalized relatively early. Usually, I would say anywhere between 12 and 24 months, we push the companies to expand their uh, activity, usually to the US. That would be the default market. So in a way, um, the companies needs to find their international strategy and expansion in a very, very early stage in their life. Unlike uh, uh, an American company that, you know, this is their market. And obviously, if you conquer the, your, that's your local market. So you don't need to expand at, a, at an early stage. Maybe later you go to, you know, Europe or Southeast Asia and other countries. But to start with, the U.S. is, is your market. Um, so I would say that's, that's, a, that's, that's probably the the biggest uh, the largest difference uh, between them. Um, the the other thing um, you know when you look at an ecosystem, just to mention it, you have basically kind of six pillars, which are talent, capital, you know, venture capital, corporates, uh, academia, uh, government support, and and culture and entrepreneurial culture. Uh, the, I think that on the corporate side as well, you have access to large corporates kind of in-house, so to speak. You are close to them. You're sitting with them uh, in the same uh, uh, state or in the same country where Israelis need to expand. They need to reach out. The business development, the development is more challenging. So I would say that the whole uh, growing of the company from seed and A round to a larger companies of B, C rounds, revenues of tens of millions of dollars is more challenging for an, you know, a non-US company. But I think that if you're aware of it and you're doing it in the right manner, 
uh, and you have help and you know coming back to Avi's uh, 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 comment and if you have specific locations that will have actually have this friendly landing pad for you and will help you to get the right talent to get the right you know uh, business development or get the right corporates to work with you maybe some incentives of the government then I think uh, you can actually overcome these challenges in a in a in a in a good and effective way. That's that's awesome because my my next thought was as you were going through that, how can Rhode Island be that friendly landing paid place for Israeli companies? You know, what are they looking for from their um, American entry location? Um, they look for, you know, I think the main thing they look for is uh, business development. They look for clients to start with. Um, so I would say business, if you can connect them to the right corporations, whether it's in Rhode Island or other places in the US. But you say, if you come to us, we have the right connections. We have this network that we can make the right introductions. That's very valuable. Uh, capital obviously is another thing that they after and talent, talent is very important. And the cost of talent is very important because in the Valley it's, 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 it's skyrocketing. So if you have good talent in a, in a reasonable prices, this is something that will be attractive for startups. On top of that, they need all sorts of services, whether it's uh, recruiting services, whether it's accounting services, legal services, the marketing services. So again, when the company goes for expand to the US, it needs to sort out all these things. And if you can give them like a one-stop shop and a vibrant community, uh, that's something that will be attractive to them. Uh, in a way, you know, when you look there are a lot of locations now in the U.S. Uh, and Katie mentioned I, I've been doing that for the last couple of years, kind of uh, 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 mainly in Miami and uh, Jersey City and, and and other areas. That you know, how do you differentiate yourself? And I think that one of the other ways to do it is through some kind of a focus on a on a vertical. Uh, so, for example, we did it in in Israel with Be'er Sheva, which is a city in the south, not very big city, uh, and we. We, together with the government, with the local uh, municipality, etc., we said, okay, this will be the cyber capital, and we kind of branded and packaged the whole city around it: uh, the university, corporates, uh, talent, the whole thing. Uh, and we we opened an office there in, as a as a VC. So I think also being relevant for a certain vertical. So let's say you take um, healthcare, for example, or ocean technologies, or things that you have some kind of advantage. Uh, and you say, okay, for these companies, we give these kind of incentives. We also want to bring this incentive to certain corporates that will also be here, maybe to the VCs or the investors we talked about earlier. So you kind of come up with a pack, package that incentivizes them, but you also package it from a marketing perspective. You say, we are this, and we are, if you're this company, by the way, not just Israeli companies, uh, if you're into healthcare, we are the best place for you because one, two, three, four. Um, so I think that the focus, and it comes back mainly to some of the uh, 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 topics I talked earlier about entrepreneurship, because it's an entrepreneurship. It's a startup of its own, you know, making Rhode Island a, a, a leading tech hub. So uh, I think focus is, is, uh, is highly important and giving the right incentive uh, to the right uh, stakeholders uh, is, is also important. Once you have this package that differentiates yourself from other locations, uh, that, that would be a good magnet for startups to come. Excellent. Yeah, Thank you. Look at the startups already have the international marketing and expansion package in place before you do the investment, or do you help them put it together as a VC? So it varies. It varies. Uh, in the seed stage, they they usually don't. They, I mean, usually the seed stage they're still in Israel, and then we, when you do the A round and B round, um, you they start to expand. And so we help them as as a VC. Uh, we try to you know uh, use our connections and the, the make the introductions. But in most cases, they don't necessarily already have all that established. So they do need help. Uh, and as a, as a VC, we can help them to a certain extent because we're not, again, we're not, we don't have this facilities in the US and we think the foot, you know, the foot on the ground and people, local people can actually uh, be more effective. 
Uh, we do have sometimes, you know, an advisory board that we, you know, recruit some people to be on the advisory board from the U.S. or other markets to help the companies. But again, it's not the location. It's not the, you know, the, the, the whole Rhode Island thing, including the government, including the university. You know, you have Brown, you have uh, CVS, you have all these assets there that once you package them together, you say, okay, this is a great thing that uh, we can offer you. And, uh, and so definitely the VCs can encourage their startups to go there because they need the help as well. You know, they, we want the companies to succeed. So uh, in many cases, pitching the, the, the ecosystem uh, to VCs is not less of importance than to pitch it to the companies. Because in many cases, the VCs sits on the board and they are part of the decision making. And so if you convince the VCs that it's a good place to be, then you definitely have uh, uh, another, uh, another supporter on your side that can help uh, convince the company why it's a good thing to come to Rhode Island in this case. I would just like to say that we are in Rhode Island working very hard to work with Israeli companies. Uh, the RI Hub, uh, which basically is a collaboration between IBM AlphaZone, uh, already yielded results and now they're connected to both the Oasis in the Ben Gurion University and to Hadassit, uh, which is an arm of Hadassah Hospital in Israel, the Hebrew University. And um, this uh, relation is growing. And um, so, uh, yeah, we we had a lot of, we have a lot to learn, but I I think we starting to to get there. Uh, and Uri, uh, I think what you told us here a lot is is, is something we will uh, definitely uh, forward also to uh, the commerce secretary, which we're working very closely. Uh, he was in Israel as governor in uh, November uh, because they're very eager to continue to develop those uh, relations. Yeah, I think by the way, there's a lot of. Uh openness in a way I, I don't think we have i mean the the usual suspects in terms of location it's usually the valley the new york or, or boston in some cases uh but um you know if you come up with the right proposal and the right pitch and the right uh, and the added value that these companies will need uh, they, you know they would be happy i mean your location is actually you know you're close to boston you're you're a train ride away from new york uh, high, you know, quality of life, not necessarily as, as expensive as the other cities. So you have definitely advantages also uh, for startups, but it needs to become, you know, branded, you know, uh, it needs to become like, a, a, you know, you know, you need to stick your flag on the map of, of, of ecosystems. And there are all sorts of programs. Again, Jersey City have this program called choose Jersey and Atlanta has its thing and Denver and everybody's trying to attract uh, uh, and uh, Houston has. And so I think that I, I would say that uh, it's definitely worth looking at what other uh, ecosystem, other cities or other regions in the US are doing, how they are positioning themselves uh, in terms of attracting startups from uh, from the U.S., by the way, but not only, obviously from uh, across, uh, across the ocean as well, for either Israel or Europe. And, uh, and some are doing it more successfully and some are doing it less. But uh, again, it's like, a, like a, you would expect a, a startup to have a good competitive analysis of who is the competitor. Your competi competitors, for that matter, are these other ecosystems and other alternatives that the startups have. And they are, you know, they're approaching these startups. So uh, I think, you know, analyzing exactly what is it that the others are offering and what is it that you can offer in a unique manner and creating this competitive advantage, uh, this will, would be something that eventually you can package in a good way and that will be effective and actually grow the attractiveness of, of Rhode Island to startups. Thank you. Thank you. That's actually um, really key to our our whole mission here, and um, something that we're working on and building. And I think um, you know, thinking about our both our proximity to New York and Boston, but also um, Rhode Island is small, so we have really great access to our elected officials and to our commerce department. And um, it's it's an asset that you know I know that Rhode Island Israel Collaborative, Rye Hub, um, Venture Cafe, Innovation Studio has definitely 
made note of, um, and we hope to be able to spread um, the word. Uh, and I think that from the little, you know, I've been talking to Avi and, and Katie and some other uh, uh, team members, um, you have the passion. So, you know, coming back to this passion idea, when I talked about when you look at entrepreneurs, uh, you, I, could, I could definitely feel the, the, the true passion that you have and the commitment that there is to actually make Rhode Island uh, uh, an attractive ecosystem um, uh, on, a, on a global level, not just on the US level. So I think that, again, like any good startup, so to speak, I think that this, this very important DNA of passion and passion people that are pushing it and driving it and believing in it, uh, that's, the, that's kind of the, the secret sauce for any successful entrepreneurship and you are it's kind of an entrepreneurship what you're doing and i think that uh you definitely have the right foundations uh you have you know you have you have brown you have some you know the academia you have some corporates you have the commitment of the government uh so you have talent so there's a lot of the of these uh, pillars of the, of the ecosystem is there so you have in a way the right ingredients for the cake now you have to bake it in the right way so it will be tasty and attractive Thank you. That's just so nice to hear. Um, so um, I once again, I, I do want to thank uh, Katie Gordon and Yuri Adoni um, for um, sharing their insights with us today. Um, it's been a real pleasure having you.